Jesus came to give us life more abundantly. That means that we don't have to do any work, but we're free to do whatever floats our boat. And in this life, the man who dies with the most toys wins. If you agree with what I've just said, you might want to leave now. <laughs> while, your, while your breakfast is still in your stomach, because we're going to be on a bumpy ride. We're going to do some white water spiritual rafting this morning. So if you think that we as men are called to do nothing, and just, just accept God's grace and enjoy everything around us, then this message is not for you. I'll let her rip. But Father in heaven, I need your help here as always. We have gathered together as a group of men, Father, seeking you, seeking your heart, seeking your will. Father, sometimes, lots of times, we get distracted by the things of the world. I'm not talking about evil things. I'm talking about things that seem to be good. Things that seem right to a man, but they lead, maybe not to his destruction, but they lead to his inefficiency, his irrelevance in this world, Lord. Teach us, Father, God, what it is that you want us to do, to be your servants and your sons. We thank you. We praise you, God. We ask that you just bless, that your Holy Spirit just speaks through me today to, to get your word out, not what I want to say. My opinions don't really matter, Lord. The opinions of the men here don't matter. The only thing that counts is what you think and what you want. And so we surrender ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is Don, and I'm addicted to sports. <laughs> You guys have maybe seen that type of a opening, you know, the Alcoholics Anonymous, where they say, my name is Jack, and I'm hooked on alcohol or something like that. I never touched this stuff. Never been on drugs. Never hooked up with a prostitute. I haven't done any of that stuff. But I'm hooked on sports. Not like I used to be. Eight years ago, I woke up. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, exactly. My digital clock said 2.00. I'm in a fog. And I feel like I've heard a voice say, write a book about evolution. Well, I don't know anything about evolution. I'm not a writer. I'm a sound mind, so I just roll over and go back to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, that experience was strong in my memory banks. And for some reason, I just went to prayer. I said, Lord, did you ask me to write a book about evolution last night. I did not expect to hear an answer. I was one of those guys that seemed like God never talked to me. But just as clear as a bell, this inaudible voice went through my head. And when you're done with that, I want you to go after Harry Potter and the sexual revolution. Here I am. I'm a 98-pound spiritual weakling. I've just been called to go after three of the biggest strongholds in our world. You know, David only had one Goliath to slay. Here I've been given the task of going after three of them. I'm like, wow, what do I do? Well, the only thing I could think to do is take one step at a time and move forward. And so I did. So, eight years down the road, I know that I'm hooked on sports. And I keep saying, next year I'm not going to watch my Nebraska Cornhusker football team next year. And there's always tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Last night, I'm listening to the baseball game. Well, I should have been getting ready for this message. One to one tie in the 11th inning, I finally says, no, that's enough. I went to bed and I dreamed about the game. I woke up in the night several times and I thought about that game. I, they, they blew it. I know they choked it. And then I go, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm hooked. I can't, you know, I, I, I look at that guy, who, I just watched a movie about a guy who was an alcoholic, and he kept going back to the bottle. I said, why can't he just stop? Just say, I'm done with it, and stop. I don't understand that. But then I look at my sports addiction, I go, oh, it's like that. Now some of you are going, come on, sports isn't dangerous. Well, and they're in themselves, they're great. 
You know, I actually think that God gets involved in sports. You know, Tebow mania. I really believe that God put Tim Tebow on the stage to bring people's attention to his name. You see, Tim's no longer there. He was there for a season, and he was traded after all the, the miracle things that he finishes that he made. I watched a movie called Linsanity yesterday about Jeremy <coughs> Lin, a basketball player who rose up from obscurity. They were going to cut him. They said, well, let's give him a chance. Two days from now, his contract expires. Let's give him a chance and see what he can do. He became the hottest sensation. He scored more points in the first three games of his NBA career than any person in history. It was amazing. Where is he today? Well, he's, been, he's on a different team. Nobody hears about him, really. But he had that moment. God <coughs> used him to get people's attention in the world. He said, look what God can do through a man. So I'm not saying that God is anti-sports. I'm just saying, just like I'm not going to tell you, you can't have a beer. But if you're an alcoholic, people will tell you, don't take a beer because that's just the start. <clears throat> next thing you know, it's a six-pack. Next thing you know, it's a case. Next thing you know, you're totally smashed. So I know, for me, I need to just get away from it, stay away, because I have more important things in my life to do than recreate and watch football and basketball and baseball and so on. Yes. Now, for you it might be golf. If you're golfing 7 by 7 by 24 all, all year long, careful. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to ask the Lord if that's what he wants you to do. <laughs> I was at a conference once with a guy named Craig Hill. Some of you might have heard him speak or heard of him. He, he wrote a, he had a, a thing called the Ancient Past Seminar. He would go out to churches and he would talk about this. Talk about the blessing of children, how parents, a father is supposed to bless his children. And so here I am, I walk up to him, you know, and I carry on this nice conversation with me. You know, he's from Denver, I said, you like the Broncos? No, I'm not into sports. You know, I talked to him for about 10 minutes and like, we have no common ground here because he doesn't talk sports. He's into God. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how many years ago that was, 15, something like that. I look back on that moment and I go, what a doofus I was. I was the one that was you know, out to lunch. It wasn't that he was less of a man because he didn't know sports. He could only talk God. I was the one who was wanting because... I couldn't talk God like he could. Maybe it's not sports that's taking up all your time. You might be just spending all your time keeping your wife happy. You say, well, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? No. God didn't call you to make her happy. He called you to cherish her, but that doesn't mean doing everything <coughs> she wants you to do. So when if you've got a honey-do list like this, you may be a little careful in examining a list and go, well, why do I need to do this? Why do I need to do this? God wants me to be spending my time doing this. Just saying. Just saying. You might, you might spend all your life trying to maintain your reputation as whatever you are. Rich guy, tough guy, whatever. You might, you know, immaculate lawn, your house, you know, you want to have the biggest, fanciest car or house or motorcycle or whatever. It's all about maintaining your image. And that's about as dangerous as territory as you can get into. That's something right. you should not be spending your time on. God has called us to a life of humility. And I know it's not easy. It's, it's such a hard thing because people say, we got to have pride in yourself. That's, that's why we, we get up in the morning because I'm I have the pride that I don't sleep all day and I don't let myself go so my body's in a wreck or whatever. I keep myself in shape, I do this, I do that, because I have pride in myself. Mm, that, maybe that pride's not so bad, but the Bible talks yeah. about pride as being something to avoid. So are we doing it for God's glory or for our own? So we're men and we go, what is a man supposed to do? You know, one of the, the things that's a common theme in literature is, is a boy becoming a man. Now, if I'm a boy, 
which I was several years ago, I'd have this question, well, what is a man? Is it just someone who, who's fathered children? Is it someone who can beat somebody else up in a fight? Is it somebody who's run a marathon? Somebody who's climbed Mount Everest? What is it that makes a man? How do you measure a man? How do you, when is it that you change from a boy to a man? Well, some quotations by some people in, in the past that have been noted. Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Thomas Macaulay said, the measure of a man's real character is what he would do if he knew that you would never find out. J.C. Watts said, the measure of a man is not how great his faith is, but how great his love is. We must not let government programs disconnect our souls from each other. And then there was the famous book, Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. <laughs> and another phrase that was commonly used, real men don't cry, which is the biggest crock that there is. We just get that word not. You know, like God's not dead, how they inserted the word not in there, or it had God's dead. They inserted the word not in different script. Well, when I, real men don't cry, I'm crossing out the door here. Because real men do cry. Because real men let their feelings, they're not ashamed to have feelings. They're not ashamed to be compassionate, to be loving, to care. Josh, would you play that song, Measure of a Man? We have a group called For Him that's going to tell us their version of how to measure a man. building, say an Empire State building, there's a blueprint. Architects spend lots of time drawing up exactly how that building's going to look. And then the builders use that blueprint to do all the things that they do as far as putting together all the mortars and walls and everything else. Do we have a blueprint as far as men? Absolutely. Jesus Christ. So we, if we have any doubts about whether we are measuring up as a man, look to the blueprint. Don't look at other men. If we compare ourselves to other men, we're going to be miserable. Because there's always going to be somebody, it's kind of like the, the, the gunslingers. They always said, there's always going to be somebody faster than you are. There'll be people that will be more talented, more whatever. If you look at them and compare yourself, you're always going to feel like you're wanting. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you look down at people that aren't doing as much as you are, or aren't as talented as you. And you'll be, feel satisfied and, and stop where you're at and not grow anymore because you say, well, I'm better than those guys. I'm a better man than those guys. They're both wrong. Don't look at them. Don't look at people. Look to your blueprint. Are you measuring up to what he wants and what he was? In our attempt to win the world by impressing the world, we have abandoned the confrontational language of the cross for the wooing language of power, might, success, and winning. The true power of our faith is power that the world calls weakness, and the victory of our faith is victory that the world calls failure. The Christ we profess to follow was made perfect through suffering. We prefer to be made perfect through success. But grace will not do for us what it did not do for Christ. Exempt us from suffering. Today is 
I don't know what you call it, between Good, Good Friday and Easter. It's the day that we anticipate the resurrection of Christ. And so the suffering that he went through on the cross is very vivid in our minds right now. You know, there's one passage in the Bible I've never heard a pastor quote. Jesus learned obedience by what he suffered. Now, if that doesn't blow you away when you analyze it, nothing will. Like, Jesus learned obedience? You mean, he didn't, he had to do the same thing that we do? He had a choice? He could have disobeyed his father? That's what it's saying. He learned obedience by what he suffered. You know, Christianity gets a, gets a rap that it's boring. And you know what? Sometimes it is. It can be. It's not supposed to be. But the Christianity that we, we have allowed to develop in our lives certainly can be boring. Now, here I am giving a sermon. Now, if you people that know me, you probably see my head nodding in the services on Sunday mornings because I have a heck of a time staying awake during sermons. I don't do sermons well. I don't have any adrenaline flowing through my body when I'm listening to a sermon. Now, up here right now, I have no problem staying awake. Yeah. <laughs> because my testosterone is flowing freely. That's good. God created us for to be men of action, mm. not just listeners. The Bible says, don't just be a listener of the word, a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. So if we're going to spend our whole lives just listening and never doing anything, we're going to be dissatisfied because we're, we're not built that way. We take teenagers and we stick them in these chairs and make them sit here. You be good and listen to this. And they're going to embrace Christianity because it sounds so wonderful. I don't know about you, but when I was a teenager, my testosterone was going crazy. You know, I didn't want to sit down in a chair much, less listen to somebody drone on. Maybe the church needs to make some adjustments in the way that we do things. Instead of playing church, you know, we need to get people's hearts involved and their, their, their bodies involved. My church that I went to had a special Sunday. They said, we're closing the church down. We want everybody to come out. We're going to go out to the neighborhoods. We're going to rake leaves. We're going to paint fences. And we're going to do this. And we're going to do that. We're going to help people. <coughs> Now, I'm not suggesting that we do that all the time, but that gives you a, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of having accomplished something, and that's something that makes men feel good. You know, sex makes men feel good, too. But it should only do that within the confines of marriage. We're restrained there, and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm not married. I'm not supposed to have this joy that other men have. I need to feel good about something. Well, mow a lawn for the 85-year-old lady next door who can't do it herself and can't afford to have a boy do it. Find, go down to, you know, Jesus told us, go down to the prisons. Talk to these people that are incarcerated. Feed the hungry. I mean, there's so many things that we can do there. Now, if you guys were at church Wednesday night, you heard me talking about warfare. That's another aspect. What's in your heart in regards to little girls being sold by their parents or being kidnapped by people who put them into sex trade, slavery? These little kids, they never have the joy of growing up with Barbie dolls and, and ponies and stuff like that. They're thrown into a world of perverse men who take advantage of them for their own pleasure. Where's your heart concerned with that? You ever feel like maybe you should do something to stop that? I do, but I don't know what. Except I use my books and my movies to try to fight that stuff, but I feel more like I need to get actively involved. I don't know exactly how to do that, but I do know one key factor here is, is I'm afraid. You know what? 
if I go out there, I try to stop somebody from kidnapping a little girl or stop somebody from doing a drug deal or something like that, I could get hurt. I kind of like not being hurt. Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Sometimes we're called to do things that are dangerous. You know, it's really funny. This guy named John Eldridge wrote a book. You might have read it called Wild at Heart. And he talked about kind of the subject about how men, they're just kind of free, free spirits, you know. He said he took his sons. They went to this river they'd never been on before, got in this raft, and or maybe it was just a canoe, and went down the rapids. And he's saying, man, you just got to live with gusto. You got to go for it. Well, if any of you people are whitewater rafters, you'd say, if he didn't know that river, that was a crazy thing to do, stupid thing to do. Just jumping out on a limb, you know, and, and doing something that's risky doesn't make it godly. And it, God might not want you taking that risk. Maybe, maybe God wants you to fight against something like the sex trade or something like that but not expose yourself to being shot or something. <clears throat> you need to consult with him. My message here today is, is you need to ask him. I'm here to, to exhort you to seek his will and what you should do. Now, if I took a poll here and said, everybody who's for sex trade, raise your hands, I would not see a hand, I know. But if I said, how many are going to stop it? You know, we might get some people, you know, right now it's easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fight against it. It's really easy to say, sitting in this nice, comfortable room here, but when you actually, when the rubber meets the road and you actually get out there and you face the bad guys, it's like, well, maybe on second thought, uh, I was supposed to mow the lawn today. My wife said I was supposed to take care of that. You understand that we have choices to make with what we do with our time. Our time is basically our most valuable commodity. What are you going to do with your life? Well, some of you say, well, what do you talk about? I'm saved by grace. I don't need to do anything. God loves me just the way I am. Well, let me put it this way. How's it going to be to spend an eternity in heaven knowing that you didn't do what God wanted you to do? I don't know about you, but I don't want to face that situation. I don't want to look back with regrets on my life and go, golly, I wished I would have done this and I wished I'd have done that. Sometimes we get this mentality that, you know, being a Christian is just avoiding sin. And boy, that is, that is a part of it. We don't want to sin because our Father in Heaven does not like sin. He hates sin. So in order to please Him, we avoid sin because we also we know it leads to our destruction if we we allow it to creep into our life. So we avoid sin. But that's only part of the equation. That's avoiding bad. Now we need to do good. We need to do what God wants us to. And that's not always the same. You may not be called to make movies. You may be one of those guys that goes out in the street and evangelizes people. Now that's something that scares the devil out of me. I go out and speak to strangers and try to tell them that they need the Lord. That's, but I have to ask myself, is it because I'm afraid and so I avoid it because I don't want to do it? Or is it because I'm not called to do it? It's really easy to say, well, God didn't call me to do that if you don't want to do it. So you have to get with him and find out what he wants. <coughs> and don't cheat. He knows your heart. You know your heart to a certain extent. He knows it better. You know, life is a balancing act, like a juggler. You ever watch those jugglers get, how many can count the number of balls he got up in the air? How do they do that? I have no clue. But as a man, you're called to be a juggler with your time. You have multiple things that are yelling for your time. You have kids, you have a wife, even grandkids, aging parents, all these family things, they're drawing you, they're demanding your time. You got jobs. You got community service. People say, well, 
we need red umpires for the basket baseball teams. We need coaches for the basketball teams. Whatever. We as men are, you know, we are in demand. People's time is not enough that they can satisfy everything. So you have to juggle it. Now one story about fatherhood kind of touched me. A little boy came to his dad and he said, how much do you make an hour, dad? And his dad said, uh, I don't know why you want to know, but $100 an hour. So his son said, okay. And he left, went to his bedroom. And his dad's going, why did he want to know how much I make? Couldn't figure it out. So he finally went to his boy's bedroom to ask him. And he found his son in there with a wad of dollar bills and coins. He's counting it all out. And he says, what are you doing? And the boy says, uh, I just count my money. I got $50. Could, could I borrow $50 from you? And his dad said, for what? What do you need $50 for? He said, well, you make $100 an hour. I got $50 already. So if you give me 50, I can buy an hour of your time. I never had a son. I got two daughters. And they were taken from me through a divorce. And I ended up being the weekend, every other weekend parent. But we can't dote on our kids and spend all our time on them to the exclusion of what God wants for us. Our job as parents is not to adore and to worship our kids. It's to worship God and to introduce those kids to God. They're not ours. They're just alone from Him. They're His kids. You know, people prioritize their lives. They say, First it's family, and then it's God, and then it's country, and then it's community, or whatever. Or some people say, first God, and then family. Hopefully that's the way you do it. But please, when you're trying to decide what to do with your time, don't shortchange the, the God portion. If he's at the top of your priority list, he's got to be the number one call on, on your time. Now, I'm not saying that you need to be at church every time it's open. We can get into this habit of playing church and thinking that we're doing God's will because we're so super spiritual that we're always at church. Church is a vehicle to get us somewhere. It's not the destination. So there may be times when God doesn't want you to go to church. He wanted you to take your son fishing. And you could be talking to him about God and getting him a you know a one-on-one -on -one and making him feel special. Or taking your daughter on a movie date, whatever. There's so many different ways that you can serve God. I remember playing a song for my kids. I used to buy all this kids' music for my kids and try to teach them God's ways. And one was, washing the dishes, Lord. I'm washing the dishes for you. And it's all these different mundane tasks that we do. But if we have the mindset we're doing it for God, that even those things that take our time, which aren't seemingly godly, become godly. We're supposed to pour out our life as a living sacrifice. That's what Easter is all about. Jesus sacrificed his life for us on the cross. You know, somebody, even atheists, would probably point out, well, if he's eternal, he really didn't die. So what did he sacrifice? I can't argue with that. But what he did sacrifice is he went through torture he let people, I'm not talking about just people, but low-down scoundrels spit on him, curse him, throw stuff at him, nail him to a cross. And what did he say to them? Father, forgive them. <coughs> I'm not telling you, and I never would tell you, 
that being a, a man of God is easy. And juggling your time in a godly fashion is certainly not going to be easy. But if you're going to pour yourself out as a living sacrifice, that means the time that you have for yourself, <clears throat> and we all need some of that. Even Jesus got away from the, the preaching and so on to get away and rest. We all need some R&R. &R, but we need to minimize that time to just the amount of time it takes to restore us so that we're... I'll use the analogy of a battery. That battery, you know, provides all that power we need to run a camera or whatever. But at some point in time, we have to put that thing back in the charger. So when your batteries are depleted, put yourself back in the charger, which means get with God. And when you're recharged, you don't stay there on the re recharger. You get back into action. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. What, what do you think of yourself in, the, in, the, in your heart? Are you a hero? Or are you a zero? You know, every man has a story. When you get to the end of your life, is your story going to be worth anyone listening to it? You, hear, you, hear, you know, you get with people, somebody who is, a, like Josh has probably got war stories, a policeman or something, all these people that have exciting lives, they have all these stories to tell about what happened on their, in the line of duty. Well, as a computer programmer, I didn't generate a whole lot of memories that people are going to you know, be riveted to and listening as I describe how I tweak this bite over here to whatever. My story is not being written in regards to my job or my recreational activities. The stories that I want to be able to tell involve interaction and work for God. Talk about, you know, talk to missionaries and stories of people that they've brought to the Lord, things like that. Some of the, some of the, the best reading <coughs> that I find is hearing those stories about how, how people, you know, like Mark tells his story about how he was taken out of the drug world. That's the kind of story that gets me excited. God is working with his people, but you've got to work with him or nothing's going to happen. You've got to surrender and open yourself. My life, I have lived more in the last eight years since God made this call upon my life, which some days I really detest. It's like, why did you do this to me, Lord? Because I'm constantly fighting with people. Lots of people love Harry Potter, and they want to have whatever kind of sex they want to have. So I've been fighting with people. But I've had more adventure in eight years than the other 56 years of my life put together. Jesus said that he will vomit us out of his mouth if we're lukewarm. Mm -hmm. You ever watch a sports team? I, you know, I, I say I'm addicted to sports. We should be careful of sports, but sports stories are so wonderful. Analogies. You ever seen a lukewarm team out in the field? <laughs> How much chance do they have of winning? <laughs> you know what's really, what's really telling is you take a team, sometimes this happens during March Madness, you take a team that's highly ranked and they draw a team that's got a terrible record, they're like, what a joke. We don't even have to show up to beat these guys. And they get on that court and it's that lukewarm fight in them, they don't bring their A game because they think it's already won. And that's why we have Cinderella's in, during March Madness. One of the reasons. So if you want to be lukewarm, that's your prerogative. Your time, your life is yours. I'm just here to tell you there may be a better way than the way you're, the way you're living it. I mean, maybe you'll explore that. I always had a problem with thoughts of going on a cruise. 
my sister went on a cruise, she said, oh my goodness, they feed you like seven times a day and they just lay out all this exotic foods and you just go help yourself, it's just a big buffet. And you just, I mean, you lounge around and wait till the next meal. And I got five minutes to, to finish this thing. I could never get excited about going on a cruise because I'm like, I'm going to be sitting there thinking about the kids in Africa that are starving to death while I'm stuffing myself. I will not allow my belly to become my God. So, I can't, I can't do cruises. I can't do you know, long vacations. What other people would consider normal things to do, I can't do it because I know that I have more important things to do. I've got maybe a hundred years on this earth, probably not that much. It's a very, very short time, so whatever deprivation, privations, whatever things I, I don't get to do on this earth because I've spent my time working for God, or whatever suffering I go through, it's this much time in history. And then I've got all eternity to be glad that I did those things for God and I worked in, as His servant and His son. <coughs> Some of you say, well, you know, why do you fight against, you know, you can't fight against the sex slavery or abortion or anything like that. Those are hopeless causes. Well, if you're familiar with the, the, the place called Valley Forge, there were a few ragtag soldiers in the Continental Army that were stationed in <coughs> Valley Forge. They had, didn't even have boots or socks. You know how cold it is up in the north. In the wintertime, these guys are up there not properly equipped. No, not properly fed. They're fighting against the number one army in the, the world. George Washington goes in the woods and he prays. If you think that America was founded by accident, I think you need to think again. God was involved. It's like, why, why did God get involved in a war? Why would God be on George Washington's side and help this unbelievable? It was, it was like, this was like March Madness on steroids to have the United, you know, the Continental Army defeat the British. Because America became the, the missionary place of the world. This is where freedom reigned so that the gospel could be preached and so that it could be spread out to the rest of the world. Well, right now, that is that window is kind of going away, and I'm not prophetic, but don't be surprised if China becomes the new United States. It sounds crazy, but the, I could see the mantle falling on China. As the, the people there are going, the church is going crazy over there, mushrooming. Back to sports, another analogy. You know, a football player, if he wants to be really good, he wants the team to win, he trains his body. He spends all this time lifting weights, running, whatever. And then he goes to the film room and he studies. And he does everything he can to be the best he can be. If we want to be good Christian soldiers, we need to go to the film room, get your Bible out. We need to spend time with other men like this and. Be held accountable. Get somebody that's an accountability partner. Keep your feet to the fire because if you're just drifting on your own, the tendency is you're going to drift off into your own little recreation. <coughs> room. How many minutes left do you have in your life? Nobody knows. How many minutes? What are you going to do with them? It's your choice. Jesus said that we will be rewarded for what we do on this earth. If you've ever run a, run in a race, at the end of it, they have an award ceremony where they hand out medals. At the end of this, this race we call life, Jesus is going to be there with a medal. He's going to hand out to those that were the victors, those who, who ran the good race. That's such a wonderful analogy that Paul used. I know as a runner, I was a runner for 40 years. I ran many races. <coughs> When you ran like a mile run, the American dream is you work till you hit retirement age, then you play the rest of your life. 
That's the American dream. Jesus' dream is you work to get to your retirement age, and then you go to work for him. That's the last lap. When you're running that mile run, you don't slow down on the last lap. You sprint. You kick it home to the finish line. I know this word hasn't been easy, and a lot of you are just going to discount it. But eight years ago, I certainly would have. I understand. I'm just here to exhort. That's one of my the things that I've been called to do is try to be a, a cheerleader slash coach. Sometimes coaches chew people's butts. Now, the other night, I, I used the analogy of Bobby Knight throwing chairs as opposed to a coach who always cajoles and praises. Well, we don't want the Bobby Knights of this world to be coaching. But we do want some people that are going to call men to accountability. And sometimes that's called <coughs> chewing butt. In a football game, before the game, the, the coach exhorts the team to go out and play well. At halftime, he chews butt and said, you're not playing well. You're missing your blocks and so on. He makes halftime adjustments. So hopefully today has been a halftime adjustment. We've made some, I've made some statements that maybe will help you become a better team player for the Team God? I hope so. Thank you.